History Center. Thank you for joining us this evening for part of our ongoing series, Experts Next Door, uh, which actually started last year, um, where we featured local experts in various topics, but uh, the program has gotten so popular, we've expanded to regional and national experts, and thanks to the internet, everyone can be next door, so to speak. Uh, so even if you're far away, uh, you can still be next door thanks to Zoom, the magic of Zoom. Uh, Experts Next Door, as I mentioned, is a periodic virtual speaker series where we bring in uh, scholars and experts and on all kinds of topics. We've had mixologists and archaeologists and authors and gardeners and all kinds of things. Um, but every once in a while, we get to have a, a historian who talks about something that's very special to our area, to Saratoga County in particular. Uh, that's obviously tonight's topic. Uh, the Experts Next Door series is brought to you by the Saratoga County History Center, which is headquartered at Brookside Museum in the beautiful little town of Boston Spa. We do all kinds of programming, both in person and virtual, and we have a YouTube channel, we have social media, we have a Facebook page, Twitter, and uh, Instagram, so please follow us there. And please uh, visit our website, uh, brooksidemuseum.org, to see what else we've got going on. Like I said, all kinds of things happening, uh, seasonal events, regular events, special events. Uh, we have a new section, check that out and consider becoming a member. We appreciate it. We are a nonprofit organization. We are entirely member driven. So we encourage you to become a member and perhaps to donate. And if you're local, maybe even volunteer. We could always use another pair of hands, both at the museum or to help with uh, some of our other programming. We appreciate your support. A couple of logistics before we get to the main event. Uh, you are all on mute. That is so that we do not have a cacophony of, of uh, coughing and dogs barking and people chit-chatting and, and excited questions yelled out <laughs> as we go along. So if you do have a comment or question, and we do encourage that, and we will do we will deal with that at the end. Uh, please type your comment or question in the chat section. If you're not familiar with Zoom, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little icon almost exactly in the middle, uh, just labeled chat. If you click on that, it should open up a chat field to uh, the, your right side of the screen, at least that's the way it is on mine. And you can see down there at the bottom it says type message here. So as we go along, feel free to type your comment or question. And at the end of, of Blake's talk, uh, we will get to those and uh, we can have some good discussion that way. Uh, it's an organized way of doing things. So please, anything that comes to your head, go ahead and type it. Uh, we appreciate your feedback and we look forward to discussing the stuff with you at the end. Uh, also, be aware that we are recording this event. We record this event, we'll put it up on our YouTube page, but we want you to understand that uh, your faces and names are part of the magic, so to speak, and will appear on the recorded uh, video for our YouTube page. Uh, with that, uh, no further ado, please allow me to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Blake Grindon received her Bachelor of Arts from Bard College in 2011 where her undergraduate thesis, The Ambiguous Frontier, Phineas Stevens as Cultural Broker, 1749 to 1752, received the Wilton Moore Lockwood Prize for Best Written Thesis and the Mark Block Prize for Best Thesis in the Department of History. She is currently a doctoral candidate in the History Department at Princeton University, where she is writing a dissertation titled The Death of Jane McCrae and the Contest for Warfare in the Northeast Natives, Colonists, and Europeans in the American Revolutionary War. Her dissertation examines the much publicized death of a single white American colonist during the early years of the American Revolutionary War, its connections to the century of warfare that preceded it, and its place within debates about legitimate violence and statehood that still resonate in the region today. She received the Florence Gould Foundation Fellowship from the John Carter Brown Library and was the inaugural recipient of the Omohundro Institute Fort, to Fort Ticonderoga Short-Term Fellowship in support of her dissertation research. In addition, in addition to her writing, she has worked in public history at the Brooklyn Historical Society 
and the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum and participated in archaeological digs in the Hudson Valley. So please join me in welcoming Blake Grinnan and thank you very much. I hand it over to her. Thank you, Michael. Um, and thank you to Anne and to everyone at the Brookside Museum who's helped out and made this event possible tonight. I'm very excited to be here on the internet with all of you um, and to get to talk about Jane McRae. And I actually like to begin first, um, as I've learned from my friends in Indigenous Studies, by acknowledging that tonight I am in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people. I think it's also significant for the history I'm about to talk about um, to say that I spent much of my life in the lands of the St. Francis Sokoki Band of the Abenaki Nation of Missisquoi, and trying to understand colonization where I grew up has led me to this project, and the work of Abenaki scholars today has contributed to my understanding of that history. So to get to Jane McRae, um, in Fort Edward today um, at the town's Union Cemetery and on a New York State historic marker by Route 4, you will come across the name of Jane McRae, a woman who was killed in the Revolutionary War. Um, this is how I first found out about Jane McRae. I imagine that with Saratoga um, County history playing a role here, many of you are coming to this already knowing about her as well. Um, and both of these Images from Fort Edward currently reflect a popular tale developed in the 18th and 19th centuries. And in this story, Jane McRae, young and beautiful, was awaiting her loyalist fiance when British allied warriors in the pay of John Burgoyne killed her. The tale of, of McRae's death spread widely during the American Revolution, and it appeared in every newspaper that was currently publishing in the 13 colonies at the time, and also many in Europe. Jane McRae, whose actual opinion on the war in which she was killed is completely unknown, was in death a great boon to the Patriot cause and a thorn on the side of the British. So how did Jane McRae die and why did her death become so famous? And as you might suspect or already know, there's some room for doubt between what her gravestone calls the thrilling incident of the revolution and the reality is what actually happened on a July day in 1777 when she died. And tonight I wanna to look at Jane McRae's family because I think that can provide insight into her life and also her legend. Jane McRae's family story helps explain how she came to Fort Edward, how the Revolutionary War came to her and how she came to be so famous. And Jane McRae crops up now and then in histories of the Burgoyne campaign published up until this current year. Um, but in these, there's often very little said about Jane McRae, the historical person. We can trace the history of her family during her own lifetime, thanks to the work of local historians in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And as I mentioned, I think seeing Jane McRae in this context helps us to actually better understand how this woman became such a myth. Along with her family, war is also a huge part of this story and two wars bookend McRae's life. The first, the Seven Years War, broke out in North America when McRae, who was born sometime around 1753, was only about a year old. The Seven Years War would shape the events of the Burgoyne campaign and many of its Native American and Euro-American participants had actually fought battles over the very same territory 20 years before, during the Seven Years' War. Like the American Revolutionary War, the Seven Years' War would be global in scope, but it also profoundly reshaped North America, both for Euro-Americans and Native Americans. In the aftermath of the war, tensions between Native nations and colonies over rapidly expanding British colonial settlement grew. With the American Revolutionary War, these ongoing disputes erupted into violence and concerns over land motivated Native people who joined the Revolutionary War, both on the Patriot and the British side. Jane McRae's death itself actually reminds us that the Revolutionary War was not only a battle within the British Empire, Though I think it's less commonly remembered as a war of native nations political struggles, it definitely was that. 
And Jane McCrae, at, and when Jane McCrae was killed, it was actually in a fight between native warriors and Euro-Americans. The regular British army was miles away from Fort Edward at Fort Anne. So to get back to Jane McCrae's family, um, they rose in the British colonial world of the second half of the 18th century. The men in the McRae family were well-educated, they held prominent positions in local communities and owned large amounts of land. The McRae's also had social connections to other similar families, both in New Jersey, where Jane McRae was born, and later in New York State. So to start with McRae's family where she was born at their home in Lamington, New Jersey. Her grandfather, William McRae, came from Ireland in the early 18th century, and his son, James, the father of Jane, continued a family tradition of Presbyterianism, founding a church at Lamington. And this church still exists. This is it right now. Um, this current building is actually more recent. It's from the early 19th century, but the congregation dates to 1740, which is the year that James McRae was first appointed to preach there. And that same year, James McRae married Mary Graham. Together, they settled in a one-room house on the west side of the Lamington River. And Lamington may sound like an English name, but in fact, it's not. The word is an Anglicization, Anglicization of a probably Muncie Lenape name that's spelled in various ways and is also actually translated in colonial histories in various ways. Um, but I think the persistence of this place name in the name of the church James McRae founded is a reminder that the McRae family were occupants of a land with a long history that preceded them. And the days of this one room house on the river were soon behind James McRae and his family. By the 1760s, he owned over 300 acres of land in the Lamington area. This land was described after his death as, quote, a plantation, the whole well timbered and watered with a good dwelling house, two stories high, with a good kitchen, a large barn, two barracks, a good orchard, and a quantity of good meadows. That James McRae's wealth had grown along with his family, he and Mary had seven children, is also shown in the description of the other property associated with the land and the buildings on it. These included farming utensils and horses, cows, hogs, sheep, and a library of books. And according to the same description, sundry sorts of household goods. James McRae also counted in his property at least one person, a man of African descent, whose name we do not know, who was enslaved in the household. The McRae's lived near the edges of a rapidly expanding colony, yet I think all this shows that they also lived comfortably. They were well-educated and well-propertied. They were able to afford a large amount of land, a substantial house, and the man whose enslavement helped them maintain this house and lands. Despite the McRae family's comfortable position in colonial society, Jane herself might have remained relatively obscure in the historical record were it not for her dramatic death. Today, most of the information about the other women in her family documents their roles as wives and mothers. Jane McRae was neither. When Jane was only about a year old, her own mother, Mary, died. And she had five older siblings at this point, as well as a younger brother. Though Jane and her younger brother would have little memory of their mother, they could have found her grave in the cemetery of the Lamington Church and read the inscription that is still there today. Not long after the death of his first seven children's mother, James McRae remarried. His second wife was Catherine Roseburg. The Rosebergs were early members of the Lamington congregation, and they were another family with extremely extensive land holdings in the area, over 300 acres. Catherine, Jane's stepmother, would give birth to five children while married to James McRae. And Jane, as the middle child in this large family, had several younger siblings and presumably would have assisted her stepmother in their care as they were growing up. And also as the middle child, she had these older siblings and would have been sort of surrounded by this group of the extended household of her father throughout most of her childhood. Although they did start to move away when she was around 10. 
1759, Jane's older sister, Mary, the namesake of the mother Jane had barely known in life, married a man named John Hanna. John Hanna, Mary's husband, had taught Greek and Latin at the local school. He had been educated at the nearby College of New Jersey, today's Princeton, where he also seems to have taught. Among John Hanna's pupils was John McRae, Jane's brother, the oldest of the McRae siblings. John McKay graduated from Princeton in 1762 when Jane was about 10. In 1763, John Hanna, Mary McRae's husband, purchased 150 acres in Pittstown, New Jersey, nearly 20 miles away from Lamington, and he and Mary moved there. In Pittstown, according to one source, John Hanna became one of the most prominent citizens. Mary, for her part, gave birth to the couple's 13 children. In 1763, the war that had occupied North America for most of Jane's childhood was officially over. It was also, of course, a significant year in the life of Jane's immediate family, as I've just said. When Britain and France signed the Treaty of Paris, officially ending the Seven Years' War, the two imperial powers did not include their Native American allies in the peace negotiations, and resentments continued on the ground in North America. Jane McRae's family would be part of a rapid expansion of the British colonies in the Northeast following the close of the Seven Years' War. In the early 1760s, many British colonists, glad that the war was over, were eager to embark on new lives. And that included settling on native lands along the frontier. John McRae, rather than becoming a minister like his father or his brother-in-law, John Hanna, became a lawyer. And after graduating from Princeton, he left the Lamington area and went to Albany to practice law, becoming part of this influx of British colonists northward into this area. Native nations in the Northeast were alarmed at aggressive colonial expansion and dismayed at their European allies' reluctance to support them. In 1765, the Mohican chief, Daniel Nimham, traveled to London and presented the Mohican nation's grievances against New York's wealthy colonial landowners. At the same period, in the 1760s and early 1770s, the Haudenosaunee, or Iroquois League, were engaged in ongoing disputes with the Albany Company regarding illegal colonial land claims. France's former allies, um, significantly for this story, residents of villages along the St. Lawrence, places such as Kahnawaka, Aquasaskane, Kanasatake, and Odanak, were dismayed that the French had not included them in the peace negotiations in 1763, and alarmed that the British assumed they now controlled these territories belonging to, to these native nations due to Britain's victory over France. Throughout the Northeast, Native people feared the continuing and continually more aggressive colonial encroachments into their land. But the region's more recent residents, these British colonial subjects who were moving into the area, felt confident that without French support, Native nations had little recourse. Colonists from New Jersey and New England were a huge part of this migration to the Albany region. Eventually, Jane McRae would be among them. Jane McRae was still unmarried in her early 20s and seems to have been in an increasingly precarious position within the household in Lamington. When she was 17 and 1769, her father, James McRae, died. He was also buried in the Lamington churchyard where Jane's mother, Mary, had been laid to rest over a decade before. And significantly, um, their gravestones reflect that within the family legacy, Jane's mother's most substantive contribution would be her children, but Jane's father would be the church that he had preached in for nearly 30 years. Jane McRae seems to have remained in Lamington, possibly with her stepmother until 1773. And that year, her stepmother, Catherine, married again, this time to Richard MacDonald, who had served as an officer in the British Army in the Seven Years' War and was also a prominent local resident. 
Around the time her stepmother remarried, Jane left Lamington herself. She'd inherited 170 pounds in her father's will, 70 of which, per his stipulation, she would just have come into as she was now 21. Perhaps this influenced her move, and perhaps it was also these changes in the living situation as her stepmother had remarried. But whatever her reasons, she went far, 200 miles to the household of her older brother, John. As far as we know, Jane never saw New Jersey again. By this point in 1773, her brother John was well established in his own household and part of this growing community that included many families from New Jersey. John McRae had married Eva Beekman, the daughter of a prominent builder in Albany in 1766. After living in the city for two years, he settled his family on a farm some three miles north of an old British fort from the recently concluded war, Fort Edward. The dilapidated fort stood as a reminder of the other wars that had marked the region and of the battles only 20 years before. Jane came to Fort Edward because she had family there. Um, by the time she arrived, her brother and his wife had at least three young children, and they were probably grateful to have the extra hands of Jane. Maybe they even requested her presence as well. But though she was far from home, John was not the only person Jane would have known there. As part of the expanding colonial settlements, three of her older brothers had also come to the region, William, James, and Samuel. Her family were not the only residents of the area who Jane McRae would have known either. Along with the five McRae siblings, another family, that of Sarah Jones, also from New Jersey, had resettled in the area. It seems that they and the McRae's had known each other in New Jersey and were now living nearby in the northern Hudson Valley. Among Sarah Jones' sons was David, who, those up to date on their Jane McRae lore will know, was Jane's reputed loyalist fiancé. The arrival of the American Revolutionary War to the Hudson Champlain region divided the former New Jersey colonists. Jay McRae's siblings, John and Samuel, supported independence early on. They both played active roles in the Albany County Committee of Correspondence. Jonathan and David Jones, the McRae's longtime neighbors, both in Lamington and in Fort Edward, though opposed, or, um, both in Lamington and Fort Edward, though they were appointed respectively as a member of the Committee of Correspondence and a lieutenant in the Saratoga militia did not share the support of the American Revolutionary cause. They actually left Fort Edward in the fall of 1777. The Jones brothers claimed that they were going to join the American garrison at Ticonderoga, but instead they went to Canada where both joined the British side as officers in Jessup's Rangers. In 1777, they would return to Fort Edward as part of the army under John Burgoyne that tried to retake the rebelling British colonies. And the war also exacerbated old regional grievances. These ongoing disputes over colonial encroachments on native lands became more violent than they had been since the close of the Seven Years' War. Throughout the Northeast, native nations were motivated to join the war based on their grievances over land. The Mohican chief, Daniel Nimhem, who I mentioned earlier, disappointed that the British crown had not helped the Mohegans against wealthy Hudson Valley colonists' intrusions onto their lands, would, with the rest of the Mohegan nation, enter the war on the Patriot side. The Mohawks, whose claims against the Albany Company had been brushed off by Philip Schuyler and other delegates from the Continental Congress, broke the neutrality they had attempted to maintain at the start of the war to side with the British. The residents of villages along the St. Lawrence were in an even more complicated position. They had, on the one hand, been long-standing um, friends of the French, and this had conducted them to the French-Canadian elite, who at this point mostly supported the British. On the other hand, they had ties to New England and New York through captives from those colonies they had adopted into their communities. This is a very fast review, obviously, of how, how these things started to play out. Um, but now I would like to jump to the summer of 1777, during which Jane McRae was killed. In July of that year, the Continental Army, retreating from Fort Ticonderoga, was fighting guerrilla warfare with the advance of the British forces. 
These were made up of parties of British Rangers, native warriors, and a few French Canadians, former officers of the French colonial troops. The native warriors from the St. Lawrence villages, as well as Anishinaabe warriors from farther west in the Great Lakes region, were increasingly at odds with Burgoyne as the campaign went on. In the closing days of July, native raiding parties fought with the retreating Patriot forces as they fled towards Fort Edward. Native warriors resented the fact that Burgoyne and the rest of the British leadership really expected them to act as the advanced guard of the army, forcing them to take the brunt of fighting. Claude Nicolas Lorimier, a prominent French Canadian who had fought alongside France's native allies in the Seven Years' War and survived Canada's transition to British rule had told a group of Kahnawaka warriors that they were expected to make the first attack against continental troops. And he got an icy response to this. The warriors jokingly told Lorimier that that honor belongs to the King's troops. By the time the British reached Fort Edward, their native allies were increasingly disappointed with the support of them. And they were also increasingly interested in fighting only their own war against the region's inhabitants, rather than the one the British command believed they were there to fight. In the last week of July, 1777, a raiding party had come upon a household in Argyle to the southeast of Fort Edward. John Allen, a loyalist, lived there with his wife and their three children. Three men enslaved by Allen's wife's family, the Gilmers, were also there, sent by the Gilmers to help with the harvest. The five family members and the three enslaved men sent from the Gilmer household were all killed by this raiding party. The loyalty of both the Allen and Gilmer households to the British crown indicates the mounting divergence between native and British goals in the war at this point. And we don't know, but this raiding party that attacked the Allen household may have been one that would shortly arrive at Fort Edward. The residents of Fort Edward and the men manning the fort expected that fighting might break out near them. The Continental Army, which had been retreating from Ticonderoga, was reinforced by a force under Philip Schuyler, as well as by the efforts of the local militia. Tobias Van Vetchen, himself part of a family originally from New Jersey, was, along with John McRae, an officer in this local militia. On July 26, Van Vetchen was among those guarding the old Seven Years Fort, as was Samuel Standish, a New England militiaman. Standish provides one of the accounts of the fighting that day. Decades later, he would recall seeing Jane McRae. And this is some of his account, which if you don't wanna read early 19th century handwriting, I'm gonna quote extensively here. Um, Standish said that he had just taken over guard duty on the hill north of the fort when, as he recounted, quote, he heard an Indian scream and instantly was fired upon by them. He ran towards the river and fort, and before he arrived, he met three Indians coming from the river between him and the fort who all fired upon him but missed him, where he was taken prisoner by them and taken up the hill again. Standish's captors, stripped him of his hat, coat, and handkerchief, and tied him in preparation to bring him back to the British camp. But while his captors prepared to take him to camp, he saw another party and recognized Jane McRae as one of the captives this group was leading. He said that he, and this is also from his, his account and his pension application, he saw a party of Indians coming with two women up the hill. They seemed to be in a quarrel. They shot one of the women and scalped her. This woman he knew to be Janet McRae. He had seen her before when the Americans offered to take her down the river. She refused to go, said she was not afraid to stay. And Standish's brief account is actually the closest thing we have to McRae's own words about any part of her life. When in, he says, she said she was not afraid to stay. This account is largely corroborated by local history as collected in the Fort Edward area in the early decades of the 19th century. It seems that Jane McRae had come to visit the household of Sarah McNeil and McRae had remained in McNeil's house. When the attack in which Standish was captured took place, Jane McRae, Sarah McNeil, and an enslaved woman of African descent, possibly a woman named Dinah enslaved by John McRae in his household, 
all attempted to hide in the house. The enslaved woman managed to remain hidden from the raiding party, Jane McRae and Sarah McNeil did not. Later, McNeil and Standish were both brought to the British camp. Tobias Van Vetchen, the local militia captain, and four other men guarding the fort were killed that day. The next day, Jane McRae and Tobias Van Vetchen's bodies were recovered and hastily buried. But it's actually to Jane's social connections that I think we owe the rapid spread and staying power of the story of her death. Almost immediately, her death came to overshadow that of the others killed in the preceding days, both those like Van Vetchen, who had been active participants in the fighting, and those like the members of the Allen household who had not. John Burgoyne, who was, as I have said, already on hostile terms with his native allies, wrote a letter the very evening that Jane McCray was killed from his camp at Fort Anne to General Simon Fraser, in which he said, the news I have just received of the Indians having scalped a young lady of their prisoner fills me with horror. And there are other sources from the immediate aftermath of McCray's death that I think make it even more clear why this particular event came to the attention of Burgoyne and would continue to be publicized as the war went on. The day after Burgoyne's letter to Fraser, two letters from American commanders, similarly vague as to the exact person, also seem to reference McCray. Philip Schuyler wrote to George Washington, quote, a body of Indians and regular troops attacked a picket detached from a body of about 150, which we keep at Fort Edward, killed and scalped a subaltern, two sergeants and a private and took four prisoners. They also scalped a woman and carried off another. Benedict Arnold, also writing to Washington the same day that Schuyler did, added the additional detail that one of the two prisoners was a young lady of family who has a brother officer in the regular service. Arnold's letter was inaccurate in some of its details. He claimed that she was actually killed closer to the British camp than she was, but his observation that she was a young lady of family who had connections to men serving with Burgoyne provides important hints as to the subsequent history of McCray. It was McCray's relatively high social status and her individual connections that raised her above the other people killed by the parties of warriors in advance of the British army. It would also help to raise her story as a symbolic representative of the war's violence and the memory of the colonial population of the region. Whether David Jones had planned to marry McCray or not, he and his brothers were on the campaign and would have known her well. Their outrage at this family friend's death probably helped to bring Burgoyne's attention to it. And McCrae did have brothers who served as loyalists. In the case of Schuyler and Arnold's letters, her death may have been brought to their attention by John and Samuel McCrae. In the subsequent memorialization of McCrae, these connections would actually continue to play a role too. And this shows up in two of the first um, literary memorializations that come out after her death. Both were written by men who, like her brother John, had attended Princeton. A year after she was killed, Wheeler Case, a Presbyterian minister in Pleasant Valley, New York, whose poem you can see in a not terribly legible, but on the, the left-hand side of the screen here, um, talks about sort of suggests that there's a relationship between Wheeler Case and Jane McRae's father, James. We don't actually know a lot about Wheeler Case. So who knows if this is true, but Case concluded his poem on Jane McRae's death by asserting that McRae's late father had prayed from the pulpit for God's protection on the British royal family. No fiction this, Case told his readers, adding to the sense that the McCrae's had been wronged in this attack. Better known than Wheeler Case is Philip Freneau, who was also a graduate of Princeton, and would include McCrae's death in his poem, America Independent and Her Everlasting Deliverance from British Tyranny and Oppression. The poem, like Case's, was written just a year after her death. But there's actually another part of McCrae's memorialization, however, which is even more closely tied to her family and to the region where she died. 
After McRae's initial burial during the war, her body would be moved two more times. In 1822, her remains were disinterred and reburied in the Fort Edward Cemetery. But in the mid 19th century, the current Union Cemetery in Fort Edward was established and Jane McRae, the town's most famous dead resident, was moved there in 1852. The event was a grand occasion, but it was also a family one. Jane's sister Mary had also not survived the war, though her death was far less spectacular than Jane's. In 1780, she died of smallpox at the home she shared with John Hanna in Pittstown. The seven surviving children of her and John's 13 were left without a mother. One of these children was a daughter named Sarah. Perhaps Sarah's father felt overburdened by his children after his wife's death, Whatever the reason, Sarah went to live with her uncle, Stephen, who had been a doctor in the Continental Army. Stephen McRae was by then living near Stillwater, New York. Later, as an adult, Sarah would apparently return to the house where another of her uncles, John, had lived in Fort Edward. She would be the one to pay for the stone at Jane's grave with the inscription you can still read there today. Jane McRae and her niece came to Fort Edward because of a wider web of family connections and shifting North American politics. This broader history, even the connection between the two women, can too easily slip into the background, I think. But it is an important part of the story of those memorials to Jane McRae that you can still find in Fort Edward today. Jane McRae's story is tied to the colonial and indigenous history of the Northeast and to the family and friends who worked to preserve her as a particular martyr of the revolution for subsequent generations. And that is it. Feels strange ending things on Zoom. I'm ready for questions. <laughs> yeah. please, uh, please open up your chat field and uh, type any comments or questions you have and we can go from there. I'll give you a moment. While we're doing that, if, if you don't mind, uh, if I can ask a question while you guys yeah. are typing yours. Um, I, I'm really fascinated about the moving of the body. Mm -hmm. um, so who, and maybe this isn't even known, but who exactly or what group exactly is responsible for the, you said twice the body was moved. Um, my mind immediately thinks, you know, someone had to pay for that. Someone had mm -hmm. to make that, some group or an individual had to make that decision. So is that... Is that something we know? And what's the story there? Like, you know, they, that takes some effort and money to do that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point. Um, I do not have a solid answer for it. Um, I do think that there is an intentional sort of like tourist reason for the moving of her body when Union Cemetery is created. Um, and there's a lot of documentation about the sort of fanfare around that. That's when there's this sort of examination of her skull that is of dubious scientific quality, but is talked about a lot. Um, and there definitely seems to be a pretty public attention. I believe that Sarah McRae, Sarah Hannah Payne, um, is cited in some stuff I've seen as the person who pays for that. Um, but that still raises the question of what, what accounts for the earlier, you know, the reburial of her. As far as I know, um, poor Tobias Van Vetchen, who's actually in the militia, is still under uh, the Route 4 road embankment. No one has bothered to care about him as much as about Jane. Um, cause he's not as exciting a story, I guess. <laughs> but thank you. I think something I want to know. And when I find out, I will tell you. <laughs> I'm glad I could help. Uh, uh, we've got a question here from Deidre Sinot or Sinot. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Uh, great presentation. Is there any indications of what nation the warriors belonged? They have a drawing that was done much later. Should that be viewed as in any way accurate? Yeah, also a good question. Um, there is a lot of attribution. I'm not quite sure 
when this starts, but I will say it shows up in a bunch of like early sort of like 1830s, 1840s histories um, that says that they are from Aquasascane or St. Regis, the town on the um, New York Canadian border. Um, and I don't know where this comes from. Like it shows up in a lot of um, sort of for these Fort Edward histories and histories of the war that talk about her death. There is also a fascinating and possibly completely apocryphal um, story that shows up in Eliza Williams' um, biography of his father. So Eliza Williams is the grandson, I think, maybe I'm missing a generation there, but I think that's right, of Eunice Williams, who is one of the sort of famous famous New England captives um, who is adopted into Aquasascane and um, uh, lives there throughout her adult life and then also sort of maintains these connections with her, her family in Massachusetts. Um, and in Eliza Williams' biography of his father, he has this footnote where he says, people have said that the warriors who killed Jane McRae were from Aquasascane, but I was in Wisconsin and I met a Ho-Chunk chief who told me that he had a hand in Jane McRae's death. Um, I have no idea whether this is true. I mean, timeline-wise it could be, um, but part of what's interesting to me about it is it indicates that this story is so popular that like it is definitely showing up at least in sort of the, you know, worldview of Eliza Williams and possibly, you know, of this Ho-Chunk guy who maybe was telling a true story. Um, it's also the only report that I've seen that specifically mentions Ho-Chunk, also called Winnebago, people being involved in the campaign. There are definitely a lot of warriors from further west sort of in the Great Lakes region. Um, so it is possible, but interesting question. I think I, oh, the other question was about the way people look. <laughs> Spending too much time with this. Um, the picture at the beginning of my presentation is I believe from uh, Courier and Ives and it is less outlandishly wrong than some of the 19th century depictions, but you will see there's some great 19th century pictures of her where there are guys like wearing war bonnets. And clearly this is like someone has seen people from like Plains cultures in, you know, like Wild West shows and is like, well, that's what Indians look like. And you will also often see Jane McRae as you do in this picture wearing, you know, clothing that is not accurate to the revolutionary period. Um, either. So there are some examples at like the Museum of the American Indian of amazing, you know, pieces of clothing from that era that Native people would have worn. Um, but none of the pictures of her death, I would say, are accurate to that in the time period. All right. Uh, actually, if I can, I, I know we got questions coming in, but you brought up a question. You brought up an issue that I had a question about, which is, <laughs> and I'm just going to have moderator prerogative here. Um, so the images fascinate me. How much, and perhaps I'm reading this and I'm a 19th century person, but how much do you think this story uh, benefits from like the salaciousness of it? Like the people, you know, the natives um, doing terrible things to the white woman is a trope, uh, you know, or the people of color hurting the white woman is an old American trope. And the images I see, she's kind of almost, you know, bare breasted. And it's like, it's very kind of, uh, voyeuristic yeah. and uh, I'm just curious if that is something that you think is relevant here if that's part of the, of the narrative or if I'm just if I'm forcing that because I study uh, another century no I think it's I think it very much is I think it gains momentum in the 19th century um I would say the most like uh salacious early account is Joel Barlow writes this in my opinion, you know, utterly excruciating long American epic poem in which he talks about her that's what the John Vanderline painting, which is sort of the most famous um, Jane McRae um, image is originally commissioned as an illustration for. Uh, and it is, if you read Barlow's account of this, like it is definitely supposed to be 
conveying that that sense. Um, I think it's a little bit. I don't want to. Say, yeah, I think it is. I think the short answer is yes. <laughs> and I think there's a bit of a connection, you know, in in like the Gates letter and stuff. There's already this real focus on her being, you know, quote unquote, dressed to meet her husband. Um, and obviously, if you think about how sh the story of her death is weaponized and then the way, um, you know, indigenous non-combatants, including women, are treated in like the Sullivan campaign, you know, this has sort of larger implications for how people are thinking about race and gender in America. All right, cool, thanks. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Kathy Moon, and I, I like the soap opera nature of this question. Did the supposed fiance ever confirm or deny the engagement? I feel like this is a Maury Povich or uh, some kind of daytime talk show, like <laughs> are the fiance or not? This is a great question. I did get to put it in the talk and I was like, I hope someone asked this question so I can talk about it. Um, I have always been very, very skeptical about the fiance story because I'm like, it just seems like such a great story and like no one mentions it in the very first accounts. However, um, I had the wonderful opportunity to go to the old Fort Museum at um, Fort Edward and look at some of the stuff there. If any of you are interested in more Jane McRae stuff and you haven't, get in touch with them. They are lovely people and they have a huge Jane McRae collection. One of the things they have there is a certain amount of info from the Jones family who end up in, uh, in uh, around Ottawa. Um, after the revolution, they're resettled as loyalists. And Solomon, who is one of David Jones' brothers, um, builds a big house there and kind of goes on to become a, a rather prominent resident. And that house is today a museum. Um, and David, who there are many stories about, you know, he throws himself into the battle at Saratoga and is killed because he's so heartbroken about Jane or, you know, he dies of a broken heart afterward. He did die relatively shortly after the war. You know, he did never marry as everyone says, but perhaps it was because he did not actually live that long after the war. Um, I don't know if he, if he died of a broken heart, um, but apparently, and I have not seen any of this because this is sort of relatively recent, recent to me, but there is definitely McCray lore that is attached to the museum that was Solomon Jones' house. And there is a account of the Jones family that a uh, descendant put together in the 1920s that they have at the Fort Edward Historical Society. And in that, um, I think it's in that or in one of the, the pieces of literature from the museum, there is a mention that his, that David Jones' gravestone in Canada says that he was engaged to Jane McCrae. So, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> There's definitely a bigger sort of sort of history about how she, you know, how she's remembered in Canada as well. All right, uh, Jenna has the next question. She asks, do we know, it's two questions. Do we know if other native tribes were upset by what happened to Jane? The second question is, were there additional tensions between the tribes because of this event or did it mainly just influence the support for the Patriots among the white settlers? Those are both good questions. I don't know. Um, I would love to know more about what the immediate aftermath of this is for participants in the Burgoyne campaign. Um, and I have not nailed down any definite answers on how, how the native participants of the campaign respond. I think it's a little tricky because it's one person, like it could have been an accident. It could have been someone's, you know, cousin who was always such a jerk, you know. Um, what does, you know, what is talked about and what Burgoyne discusses a lot later on when he's sort of trying to defend himself about Jane McRae and also the fact that, you know, he did not win the American Revolution um, is, that he asks, he says that he asks for the man who has killed her to be turned over to British authorities. And he claims that he is persuaded by Luc de la Corne, who's one of these French Canadian officers who's on the campaign, not to do this. 
Um, and therefore he doesn't do it because LaCorn tells him this will alienate his allies. Um, I believe that perhaps Burgoyne asked for this man to be turned over and he was not turned over. I don't think that's because Burgoyne made a wise decision about how to, how to um, not annoy his native allies because he doesn't seem to have been very good at that otherwise. Um, in general, less with, with McCray specifically, but there are interesting things that start happening, especially a little bit later in the campaign when you get closer to Saratoga, um, where the forces that are sort of, uh, the Patriot forces that are fighting the Mohawk River leg of the campaign come back towards the Hudson. Um, and among those are Oneida, Tuscarora, and Mohegan warriors. Um, and I think it seems as if so that is also part of the reason that Native allies start leaving the Burgoyne campaign, that they actually don't want to be involved in more fighting with um, other Native nations, especially, you know, other nations within the Haudenosaunee League, as had happened at Aristide. All right, and I think it's important to remind the uh, audience, for those of you who are not historians, uh, there's always the perpetual problem of sources and and uh, credibility of the limited sources you have. I mean, if you're researching in the mid 18th century, um, you know, you, you, you don't have a lot to choose from. Uh, it can be very frustrating. And then as as Blake has said, you don't you can't even fully trust the few sources you do have. So sometimes, you know, historians, we just have to we have to accept, settle for I don't know. And, you know, hopefully we, we can look into it at another time, but you know, sources are a problem, I'm telling you. So, all right, uh, next uh, comment uh, comes from Sandra. She says, I have information prepared by the Fort Edward Historical Association that says that Jane's body was removed from the Route 4 site in 1822 because the nearby Champlain Canal was being constructed and that disturbed the graves there. She was then reburied in the State Street Cemetery in Fort Edward before her burial in the Union Cemetery. So does that make it wow, okay. thrice, thrice she was moved? Yeah, so it's even more. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. The, the local knowledge comes through for, for a question that asked earlier. Well, if we get even more local, this Lawrence says, I have a friend of mine who has ancestors with the McRae name. Is there a resource with information about the descendants of Jane McRae's siblings? Uh, there are a few. Um, the, I'm trying to think if there's a good, like, there are a couple. Um, there is an article um, in the Somerset County Historical Society for, can give you the volume number. Uh, if I can just pull up my talk here. Uh, I believe it is in 1916, um, but it's by someone named Honeyman who was one of the, the editors of the Somerset County Historical Society. And he kind of goes through the, the Jane McRae generation relatively thoroughly and talks about um, the, all the siblings and as far as he knows sort of where they end up. Um, so that is a great place to start. The other place I will say, um, and this is maybe sounds a little odd, but it was really helpful for me. Um, Princeton University um, has the slightly bizarre practice um, being a university with a lot of funding of uh, keeping a file on everyone who's ever gone there. And those files are in the Mudd Library at Princeton. So there is a file on John McRae, as well as on, I think, uh, I can't remember if it's one of his sons or another nephew of Jane's um, who also went there. And those have a fair amount of research. In them. I mean, it's basically you're looking at a file of someone's research notes, but that's how I found out about the Somerset County um, Historical Society piece. Um, 
in terms of sort of genealogy stuff, those are the first two ones that, that come to mind. All right, any other last uh, questions or comments there? You can type them. Uh, Blake, where are you in your, uh, in your dissertation progress? Or... Great question. <laughs> Great and possibly ominous question, of course. Um, I would say I'm sort of in the middle. Um, I have written two chapters so far that are kind of the lead up to this. Um, it's a strange time to be doing research, although I'm also very grateful for the power of the internet. Um, I have not made it into quite as many archives as, as I would have hoped yet, but that is stirring again, which is nice. Um, so yeah. There will be, you'll be hearing more from me about, about Jane McRae a lot in the coming, coming years. Well, we, we would love to have you <laughs> back and do an, perhaps an in-person event. I would love um, that too. Or maybe we could set up a kind of, um, maybe you can do an event on one of the sites. You know, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, we could do something out in the field. You know, people love that kind of thing. Uh, Julie here says, I am wondering if your presentation is available to listeners in a written form I am a descendant of Jane McRae's family and would like to have more information about this story. That's so exciting. Um, I am pretty easy to get in touch with. Uh, either, either Michael can pass along um, my email or if you Google my name, uh, which is an odd one, you will probably see me on the Princeton History website. Um, and I'd be happy to, to pass along um, any of this info about about any of that too. Yeah. Thank you for thank you for coming. Okay, uh, Dave Peck uh, may have sent you a message just oh. to you, not to us. Okay. Can you check that. I want to make sure. And then we've got something from Jim. What Richmond. am I? At seven fifty nine. Oh, here we go. There we go. Uh, I'm just going to read it so everyone can hear it. Uh, are you familiar with Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who was active in recognizing Native Americans in central New York? There is a museum in Fayetteville about her now. I am also descended from a sister of one of the Kilmers. Maria killed the day before Jane McRae. Um, I have not been to that museum. No, um, I would love to. Uh, one of the things that, along with archives that I have sadly not gotten to do quite as much of, although I did a little bit this summer that was wonderful, is kind of going around and seeing how this history is remembered on the ground. Um, and I will add that, add that to my list. Um, I also wanna say it's such an honor that there are so many people uh, connected directly to this story here. Um, and in seeing this message typed out, I have answered one of the questions that I was asking myself, which I have seen that name spelled both as Kilmers and Gilmers. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go with Kilmers now, so. Uh, if I don't think I missed anyone else's okay. questions, yeah. if I did, give me a give me a shout out from the chat. Jim, Jim Richmond, who is uh, has written uh, several pieces about uh, history here, he has a comment. It says great presentation, especially interested in the family genealogy. I understand that at least four brothers moved in the area, including James, who purchased uh, 1,250 acres on Middle Line Road in Boston. Uh, Jim is our expert on middle line. Uh, do you have any insight as to why they came here? I do not. <laughs> um, it is interesting to me that there seems to be this cluster of people from New Jersey, including from this, you know, relatively small settlement where her family is from. Um, but I don't know. If anyone knows, tell me. <laughs> All right, it looks like that's it. This is a last call. Let's give it a second here in case anything pops up. All right, well, I appreciate you all joining us this evening. And I, I wanna thank again, uh, Blake, who graciously uh, donated her time. Uh, and she also uh, helped us debut our new blog. You can go on our website and check that out. It's called The Compass. Uh, she uh, goes into some of the aspects of why the story is important and why we should care about it. Uh, so please follow up uh, by reading that piece on our website. And if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out directly to her or uh, to me, and I can put you in contact with her. Uh, again, we're from the Saratoga County History Center, and we appreciate your 
support. Thank you very much and have a good evening. That's it for Thank us. You, Thank you.